Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 3130, Modern Geometries for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misselvein. Lecture seven has two main goals. Uh, the first of which is to finish developing the theory of incidence geometry, which we began in uh, lecture six. Uh, the second half is that we're gonna introduce the so-called parallel axioms, the parallel postulates, uh, parallel alternatives. Uh, that discussion will actually take place in the second video for lecture seven. This first one, again, is just developing the theory of incidence geometry. You which you will recall in lecture six, we introduced the four axioms, uh, the four axioms that David Hilbert gave for incidence uh, between lines and points. Uh, we gave them line, we gave them names line determination, which says that between any two points, there exists a unique line. Um, so two lines determine a point, excuse me, two points determine a line. Uh, the second one was secancy. Secancy says that every line has at least two points. Point existence gave us that there exists at least three points in the geometry. And then non-collinearity says that uh, not all points are on the same line. Now we developed a long list of theorems of incidence geometry using axioms of line determination, point existence, and non-collinearity. We haven't used the secancy axiom yet, and I promise you we do it in this video. Well, a slight JK on that one, that we're, we're gonna do it on the next theorem. This theorem probably could've got squeezed onto the previous video, but I didn't wanna make it too long, so I, 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 I wanted to break it where we are now. And this break is the same natural break that one would usually have in a face-to-face -face lecture, uh, that we do all of this in 50 minutes, just like so. Um, so let's let's remind ourselves where we are. We've proven that non-collinear sets exist in incidence geometry. That I can given you know given two points or one points or no points, I can always form a set of three non-collinear points. What we're trying to do is develop the same idea for non-concurrent lines. That is, we don't want to have something like this where every line goes through the exact same point in our geometry. We don't want that. We want that the set of all lines is non-concurrent. We're working towards that. So uh, the last thing we did uh, in the previous video, just as a reminder, we proved that if there's a point, then there's a line not on that point. So this is like the dual arguments to the non-collinearity axiom. Uh, we've also proven that for each point, there exists at least two lines that are incidents to it. Okay, so what we want to do now is this first theorem, we're going to prove really line existence. Okay, um, we're going to prove that there exists at least three lines. The point existence axiom says there's at least three points. Why are there at least three lines? Well, basically, we're going to come up with a set of three non-collinear points. We can't start with point existence because point existence says there's three, there's three points, but those points could be collinear and we only get one line. Uh, that would give us at least one line, but we want to show there's at least three lines. So by theorem 148 from the previous lecture, which told us that there exists a set of three non-collinear points, we have three points, call them P, Q, and R. And then using these three points, which we know are non-collinear, line determination says there's a unique line between P and Q, there's a unique line between P and R, and there's a unique line between R and Q. None of these lines can be the same line because if any of them were the same line, uh, then that means all three points would have to be on the same line, they'd be non-collinear. So that would violate Theorem 148 in our lecture series. Theorem 148 required point existence, it required non-collinearity, and, and it required uh, line determination. This theorem also uses line determination, so we've used those three axioms, and this proves the dual of point existence. This gives us line existence. There's at least three lines in our geometry. So, uh, you know, a little bit of a fib. We didn't use secancy yet, but that'll be remedied in the next theorem. And this is, this is the last major theorem. We're gonna do, there's like a short corollary that's gonna follow after this, which is our main target, but this is the last heavy lifting we have to do. Um, if L is any line, then there exist lines M and N such that L, M, and N don't have the same intersection. That is, uh, they, they're non, uh, they're non-concurrent. So basically the picture we're trying to find is the following. If you have a line L, there's gonna be other lines that form something like this, that they're not concurrent to it. And this is finally where C can C is gonna come into play. So we're starting off with a line. And I just, I guess I should mention that this statement we're trying to prove right now is very similar to a statement we proved previously. In fact, this statement we're trying to prove is essentially the dual statement to theorem 147. 
Theorem 147 we proved in the previous video says that if P is a if P is a point, then there exist points Q and R so that P, Q and R are non-collinear. We want to do the same thing with lines and non-concurrency. All right. So imagine we have our line L like so. So this would be our line L. Now, finally, 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 we're going to use the secancy axiom. Just because we postponed it doesn't mean it's not important. Um, we developed all the previous theory without secancy, but to get this, to be able to switch from points to lines, we do need secancy here. So by secancy, we have that L contains at least two points on it. These points will be distinct. We'll call these points P and Q. Now, by theorem 1.6, which in the previous lecture, uh, theorem 1.6 said if you have two points, P and Q, that are distinct, there exists a third point, R, such that the set P, Q, and R are non-collinear. So, in particular, R is not on L because P, Q, and R are not collinear. Now, using line determination, there exists lines uh, between, a unique line between P and Q, excuse me, P and R, and a unique line between Q and R like so. Now this feels like the set of points I'm looking for. So let's call these lines. Do I give them names? I think I do. Uh, there's a line M. M is the line that's between P and R. And then N is the line between Q and R. So I'll stick with that using my the same notation in the theorem right here. I claim that these lines are non-concurrent. Is there a point that's on all three of these lines? Call that point S. So let's say that S is on the intersection of L with M with N. Is there such a point? Well, if there was a common point S incident to all three lines, then that would mean that S would have to be distinct from P, Q, and R. Because as P, Q, and R are not collinear, there's no line that contains, well, I should say, but these three lines do not contain, they don't all contain P, they don't all contain R, they don't contain Q. So S is a fourth point. That's important to note here. Then the lines L and M would have two distinct intersections, right? So if we look at L, P is on both of them, and so is S. So we get that P and S both are on the intersection of L and M. And as we proved with theorem 144, which is basically just line determination, that the intersection between two lines must be at most one point. So if P, since S is not P, there would have to be a second point of intersection. That's a contradiction. So there's no point that's on all three of these lines. So these three lines are non-concurrent. And then as a corollary of that theorem right there, uh, there exist three non-concurrent lines. So the previous theorem says that if we have a line, I can construct two other lines which are not concurrent to it. Um, so how do we get lines? Well, line existence says there is a line. So we have a line L, and then the previous theorem is applied for which then we are done. And so this then gives us, uh, you know, three lect or three video, excuse me, three theorems of instance geometry in this video. The previous video gave us, um, let's see, I'll just count them real quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven theorems. So plus three is 10. Between the two videos, we've now proven 10 theorems of instance geometry. And honestly speaking, that's about as far as we can go. Um, there's a few other things you can prove for which uh, for my students, I'll ask you to explore some of these things in the homework, uh, but it really you can't push the envelope much farther than we are right now because incidence geometry is very broad axiomatic system. And this is always this is always the concern one has to take. Do I want diversity or do I want lots of theorems, right? Do you want lots of models or do you want lots of theorems? The more theorems you have, the fewer models you have. But the more models you have, the fewer theorems you have. Um, when it comes to Euclidean geometry, we have tons of theorems, tons of things we can say about Euclidean geometry because there's only one Euclidean geometry up to isomorphism. But for incidence geometry, there are so many, so many different incidence geometries, but as a consequence, there's only so many things we can say about them. So in some essence, we've completed our theory of instance geometry because we've 
we've basically said what we can. What are the broad theorems that cover everything about instance geometry? That's not to say that, that we're done talking about instance geometry. What, what that really means is that we're going to see a stack more things on top of it. We're going to stack more axioms onto instance geometry to get a more restrictive geometric structures, but all of those geometries will retain these 10 theorems we've developed right here and any other theorems of instance geometries we haven't talked about. Uh, so in the next video, like I said, we're going to talk about parallel alternatives. So the incidence axioms don't say anything about do parallel lines exist or not. And when we look at Fano geometry, it had no parallel lines. Young geometry did. So it appears that parallelism is independent of the incidence axiom. So if we want to say things about parallel lines, we are going to need another axiom that says something about parallel lines. And that's exactly the target of our next video.